I fell in love with, um, first of all, with jazz, American, particularly traditional jazz, New Orleans jazz, which was very popular in Britain at that time. And there was a guy in one of the best known British New Orleans jazz bands was, was Chris Barber's jazz band. And he had his guitarist and banjo player was a guy from Glasgow called Lonnie Donegan who invented, I guess, a, a, a kind of form of music that he played when the band took a break in the middle. They went off for a beer and Lonnie Donegan would entertain the audience with American folk songs. His songs were all, um, I guess what around here would be called jug band music. And the young people, people of my generation, very quickly realised that you know, if they bought a cheap guitar and learned three chords, they, they could emulate this to some extent. And we all did. And that's how I came, that's how I became uh, a part-time musician. The guy who started uh, one of the earliest folk song clubs in Scotland was a guy called John Watt. And he really was my mentor uh, back in those early days. And John decided to start a folk song club in Dunfermline. Um, my involvement at that time, I'm pretty sure, was, was, was not that musical. I was just somebody who helped. I'd helped to set the place up and went along. But can we wear them meet again? You'll hear who it can play. Oh, wow, the little, wow, the little, wow, the little, die, oh. They had no idea what they were hearing, all, Jack and all of his friends, but they became the last link between the guys who transmitted these songs by singing them to each other and the generation that recorded them. So Jack was really one of the last people in that group in Scotland to hear songs that could only be heard. They weren't written down anywhere. These were still the free-flying versions that people were still singing. They weren't written down. So Jack got an earful before he knew how to recognize he was getting an earful, and so did all of his friends. That's when Barbara arrived, Barbara Dixon. She came along, she was still at school at the time, she came along with her friends. She shouldn't have been in there because she was underage and it was on licensed premises how she came and she met up with me and Barbara and I found ourselves a duo. I get in my he was like a really lovely big brother and my he because he'd been properly brought up his parents were nice respectable folk and he was being asked to look after this this young lass um, who he was admittedly singing with, but I was by no means an equal, certainly when it came to life, you know, and I went to various things with Jack and, you know, kind of went off the rails and he would sort of reel me in and say, it's time for you to go home now, Miss Dixon. And that was a, that was an incredible time because uh, we were learning an enormous amount about the songs at that point. We were you know, totally engrossed in it. Um, Barbara would come to my house. Still, I was still living with my parents at the time. And Barbara would come to the house, and we would be practicing and recording stuff and listening back to it and all this sort of thing. Um, and doing lots of gigs. I mean, at that point, when Barbara and I were singing together, we were we were making more money. Um, you know, you were asking earlier about the difference between professional and semi-professional. We were semi-professional, we both had, you know, day jobs, but we were making more money singing than we were on our, our day jobs. It was mostly um, uh, traditional songs in, in, the, in the Scots language, and we were very lucky because we were in the tail end of the life of the traditional singers. So Jeannie Robertson and uh, Jimmy Macbeth, 
um, Bell Stewart and all those people who are, who are so important now in the history of the, the folk scene because their songs were captured on tape for the first time really. It came on a flush of enthusiasm in the late 50s and into the 60s by loads of people who, as I was saying earlier, suddenly discovered that on their own doorstep they had a form of music that spoke to them. It wasn't something coming out of a radio, it wasn't something that was coming from a recording company or out of a TV screen. It was their own history, it was their own community. It was, and most people didn't know and still don't know that it's there. All the traditional ballads, all the songs about historical events in, in various parts of Scotland. And then it did what things that are having a vogue nearly always do, it slid away. You know, the, the, the youthful enthusiasm energy audience moved on to something else. But a lot of the musicians hung on and kept doing it, whether anybody was listening or not. And Jack was one of the ones who stuck with it. And for me, it was always the music. And I was always fascinated by uh, the music. Uh, the language of the ballads and the songs, uh, this very archaic, uh, very particular kind of language. Uh, I eventually began to realise that it was the, it was the travellers, it was the gypsies, it was the tinkers in Scotland because of their way of life who had kept a lot of that tradition going. This struck me as great because I remembered when I'd gone to uh, Cayley's uh, with some of these travellers, you know, ten years earlier, going to their houses or into their tents. They made no distinction between the songs, the stories, the riddles, the music. It was all mixed in together. So I thought it'd be great to have a group like that. And I found myself in the mid-1970s with with, uh, surrounded by people who uh, were very open to that idea. So I helped to start a group, a group called Heritage. It's here, here with Heritage. In by Fisher Row, Muscle Barrow was near me. I threw off my muscle peak, curted away my dearie. Upstairs, downstairs, the mer stairs bear me. I think it'll lying till I'm a lane when I'm sent here, my dearie. I knew of Jack Beck, I'd heard his music before with Heritage, and I, I knew that Jack was a a uh, compatriot of Archie Fisher and Barbara Dixon and some of these revered uh, singers. But I also became aware that Jack was something of an expert on this uh, um, strand of music, Appalachian music. And, uh, he's a great storyteller and a scholar, as well as a, a ballad singer and performer himself. But he outlined the fact that when Cecil Sharp, the great ballad collector, came to the Southern Appalachians and uh, collected music and produced his book, English folk songs of the of the Southern Mountains, so the Southern Appalachians, um, that of the top ten most popular songs he collected, seven of them were Scottish, and the top three were all Scottish. So Jack was very interested in making sure people were aware of the true origins of these songs. Well, the story goes deep into history. Uh, one of our interviewers said, the, the whisper of the Middle Ages, back to the troubadours of Southern France, uh, but their music spread through the minstrels into the British Isles and into Scotland and England. And of course, the song collectors there, Sir Walter Scott, Robert Burns, um, and uh, the songs of the travelers and all the rest. But for the migration of the music that came to America, um, it left Scotland to go to Ulster, Northern Ireland. So from Scotland to Ulster, from Ulster to Philadelphia, and once again down the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road, when they made their way down through the Shenandoah Valley, some of them found ways to settle and farm and create communities there, and many of them ended up in the Southern Appalachians. Uh, they were a tough breed, 
and they were up for the task and that's how really the, the Scots-Irish ended up embedded in the hills and hollers of southern Appalachia. When I came over here, I started hearing old time music for the first time, heard Appalachian ballad singers and very quickly realised that this music was connected to where I was from and it fascinated me how it had changed and how it sounded. Um, what was that leading into to remind me? <laughs> oh, the carrying stream and, that, and the connections to over here, that's right. And I started coming down here. That's when I began to hear music from around here. And this was, uh, this was, you know, local music from this year, played by local musicians in, you know, very much a local style. And that was a real, that was a real eye-opener to me. Not so much the fact, you know, I always joke about it, that the first time I ever got together with musicians down here, they were surprised at how quickly I could join in with the guitar until I pointed out that, you know, a good number of the tunes they were playing were originally Scottish tunes or Irish tunes or even Shetland tunes. It wasn't, that wasn't so much what caught my ear. It, it was the real indigenous music of this area that caught my ear. And I, I've become fascinated, absolutely, totally fascinated by this thing that you call the carrying stream, the, the connection between uh, I guess you'd have to widen it to European music and uh, American music because there's, you know, there's there's hints of Scandinavian, uh, German, French, uh, as well as Scottish and Irish. The fact that he lives in the States, yet he's very rooted in Scottish music, but I can see that in in the music that's gone back and forth. You know, the people we learned the music from originally were Americans, but they're very much American songs in the main. And then we, um, my generation and the generation after, brought our take on those songs and Scottish songs, maybe that people in America hadn't heard and played them here. But I was always aware of Appalachian music. I was always aware that those songs had come over um, with the, the emigration of, you know, uh, 100, 200 years ago with people. And the songs had changed, but they were the same songs. So there's a real shared tradition there. My red rosy cheek when you're in a far off land. It strikes me that uh, Jack was again one of the first people yeah. that, that uh, I learned about the influences of Scottish song in, in Carter family. Um, and if I can quote Jack, in fact, who's quoted in the book, he said, uh, if I hear someone like uh, older people singing a song which has a verse in it, for instance, which goes, who's going to shoe your pretty little foot, who's going to glove your hand, I know that and comes straight, straight from, from Lord Gregory. Gregory. You, you know, know the lass of Loch Ryle. I know the Scottish ballad of where that comes from. I love the idea that it's still there and it's still being sung and it's, it's all still, still there. there. And then he says, and you can hear it in his voice, oh, there's a shiver goes down my spine every time. The storms are on the ocean the heavens may cease to be This world may lose its motion If I prove That's why Appalachian uh, music is so interesting because it is that story of a movement of people and a coming together of influences really from different parts of the world, the European, the African, into this, as Doug says, beautiful texture tapestry. My interpretation of what Hamish Henderson was talking about with the, the carrying stream is culture uh, in the form of stories, tunes, songs 
taking a journey. Um, and I think he made that journey into the idea of a stream because in a stream you have boulders, you have the banks, you have all sorts of things that affect the water that's carrying down that stream. So the stories, the songs, the tunes, they bounced off all sorts of things and they became changed by that, but they, but they kept on going. Except maybe for short spells at a time. I don't think Jack's life went the way he expected it to at any given phase. You know, when he was a painter and decorator, I don't think he expected to be traveling so widely among all the European folk festivals that he did and so on and so forth. When he started going back and forth to the States, I don't, I don't suppose it crossed his mind for a moment that he would meet the love of his life. Maybe not even the, the, when Wendy first spoke to him and said, can I come and interview you? That he would wind up becoming an American citizen, that he would become so embedded in the life of a place like Big Stone Gap and where he is now. And all these connections and all these happenstances that have shaped his life have come about in the end because he was putting in the time and effort into doing something that he, it's not, I don't think it's even that he felt it was worth doing, he believed it was something that was worthy of the best efforts possible. And that was the music and the background and the culture that it came from. And, I mean, it, it, th this isn't some kind of ascetic mission. It's that the music grabbed him where you feel it most and kept its grip on him and has enthralled him. I think that's a better word, has enthralled him all his life. Then you'll marry me, lassie, at the kirk of Arne Boozle, till the day you die, lassie, ye will never repent This This brings us to the a very important question. Uh, what is more important, the performer or what they are performing? Um, and there's a good Scottish phrase, the sang is the thing, the song is the thing. Um, you know, many people sing these songs and many people play these tunes. Um, and somehow the songs, the ballads, the tunes, the stories, they... They continue. Now, why on earth would they continue? Why why would they go on, you know, down that stream, geographically or through time? Well, I think it's because, for whatever reason, they continue to um, have something to say to us. They remind us of things. They have a, an appeal that that continues to intrigue us and, and to, um, I was going to say entertain us, that's the wrong word because although they are used to entertain, particularly nowadays with, you know, professional popular folk singers and that sort of thing, um, they, they, they survive because they deserve to survive. I'd like to quote Jean Rich actually because I think her family, uh, how they held on to songs over the generations um, in the hills of eastern Kentucky was all about remaining connected, remaining, um, having a sense of where you were from and being, if you like, part of a family and that was also a family of song. And she said, um, the lovely past was not gone, it had just been shut up inside of a song, inside of a hundred songs. I knew that no matter how far apart we might settle the world over, that we'd still be the Ritchie family as long as we lived and sang the same old songs, and that the songs would live as long as there was a family. So that sense of the songs and the sense of family and connection being inextricably linked, I think is one reason why the music endures um, today and 
will always go on. I think that's a pretty good benediction. <laughs> <laughs>